Major takes a look at Europe. One spring day, 13-year-old Francie Huffman sat in her Canton, Ohio schoolroom, studying a map of Europe and wishing, wishing that a magic carpet would sweep down and carry her away to this magic land. Away off to the land of her forefathers, to London, Paris, Rome, Venice, Madrid, and all those other wonderful places on that colorful map. Suddenly, the map came to life and a little airplane began to move out to sea. Francie sighed. Oh, that's my plane. That's my trip. I can see myself at the airport boarding that plane now. Yes, indeed, it is your plane, Francie. Step right up. Here is your magic carpet. It's your dream come true, and there's many a thrill ahead of you. Eighteen hours later, Francie was skimming over the blue waters of Lisbon Harbor in Portugal. She snapped this picture of her mother and the interpreter walking along a Lisbon street. She noticed that the Portuguese people looked much like the Americans. The houses were of beautifully carved stone and brightly colored plaster. The men wore dark suits and ties, for it was Sunday. took an automobile ride through the Portuguese countryside. But speak for yourself, Francie, and tell us, what did you see? Oh, Portugal was a beautiful with the streamy harbor below, and farmers plowing brown terraces on the green hillsides that rolled down to the sea. In the distance lay Lisbon, white as snow. to Lisbon city limits, the bumpy cobblestone streets gave us a rough ride, but the mosaic patterns in the walks were more beautiful than anything I'd ever seen in America. The public buildings and advertising signs were much like ours in the big cities of the United States. charge only two cents per ride. Along Lisbon's waterfront, Francie got acquainted with the fish ladies, who balance baskets of fish on their heads and sell them to housewives, and Lisbon boys who are compelled to go to school only four years. and I visited the Instituto Odivelas, a school for daughters of Portuguese army officers. Many of them spend summer vacations at this beautiful ancient castle perched on the edge of the ocean. Here they are wearing their Sunday suits. We climbed high up into the parapets of the old castle to get a better view of the ocean.
now remodeled and provided with every convenience, the girls study and play in the charming cloistered courtyard. The tree you see here, bursting into bloom, is an almond tree. The Portuguese girls were most kind to me and put on a special folk dance for my benefit. Here you see them in their regular summer costumes out for a walk and in the background an ancient olive orchard on the hillside. Here you see me in a white smock learning to play Portuguese games. The girls chant quaint folk tunes as they skip in rhythm. When I left, they gave me this little doll which they made with their own hands. For one glorious week, Francie lived in the fabulously beautiful Hilton Castellina Hotel in Madrid and attended Lope de Vega School. Spanish schoolgirls walked miles to visit her and have tea at the hotel. They laughed and talked mostly in sign language. Yes, and I got my first glimpse of the old world method of doing things the first morning trip I took outside of Madrid. These carts pass as carrying rubbish from Madrid to the city dump. And from these fountains poured the cold water in which all the ladies of the village washed and rinsed their clothes. See how expertly they cast the cloth upon the water? In the early morning hours, the roadsides were covered with herds of sheep. Francie stood still and the sheep walked quietly around her. Nearby, she made the acquaintance of a Spanish highway policeman. He walks and stands all day at his post. Spanish men, women, and children lounged at midday in the ancient Toledo's public square, soaking up the spring sunshine and visiting. This lady was friendly and happy to have her child photographed. Everywhere were museums housing world-renowned paintings of Spanish masters. Francie and her mother visited the home of El Greco. Madrid at evening, we passed a farmer plowing with oxen. Through our interpreter, I asked if I might learn to plow. His weather-beaten rosy cheeks were wreathed in smiles as he said, si, si, yes, yes. A shepherd nearby let me hold a newly born snow white lamb and a black sheep. Only a few hours by TWA magic carpet and Francie was in Rome. St. Peter's Cathedral at Vatican City was as big and beautiful as I thought it would be. But imagine my surprise when I found an American amusement device down the street, operating in the very shadow of this world-famous church. The ruins of Pompeii were silent as a graveyard, and the big volcanic stood black and sullen in the background like a pouting bad boy. Like all the visitors to Venice, 
I fed the pigeons in St. Mark's Square. And I saw the famous author, Ernest Hemingway, standing on a pier waiting for his gondolier. He waved at me. What a thrill gliding along the Grand Canal before the silent sweep of the gondolier's long blade. Venetian councilmen refused to let American architect Frank Lloyd Wright tear down this house to make way for one of his own design. Do you suppose this watery city has a fire department? Indeed it does, and here it is. Venice was built on a series of islands in the 12th century as a protection against its enemies. The entire city has been slowly sinking on its wooden piles until more than two-thirds of it is completely covered and the remainder of it is partially flooded during the spring tides. Engineers say there is no way to save it and believe it will be uninhabited by the end of this century. that left a black stain on her hands. She was also selling squirming eels. And this is the way they conduct a funeral in Italy, with the mourners walking behind the hearse on the way to the graveyard. This fabulous clock is located in St. Mark's Square in Venice, Italy, and has counted out the time by three different methods for over 500 years. Most charming feature of this clock are the iron men who strike the hour with their iron mallets. One of the biggest thrills of my whole European trip was meeting our American ambassador in Switzerland, Miss Frances Elizabeth Willis. We were her luncheon guests at her lovely home in Bern. When our magic carpet flew over the tip of the great Matterhorn Mountain near Zermatt, Switzerland, I never dreamed I would climb it. But here I am, 10,000 feet up in this 15,000 foot mountain, watching the skiers glide at neck-breaking speed down the miles of icy trails. Little cog rail ski trains lug people up and down the mountain all day long.
attended an international girls' school at Lausanne, Switzerland. The girl at the left is a Turkish girl. The one at right is Dutch. There are 26 nationalities represented here, and all are required to speak French except on Sundays when they may speak their own language. I visited Anton Preisinger, the Christus of the Passion Play. He took me all about the town and theater and patiently answered my questions about this greatest of all religious plays which depicts the life and death of Christ and is presented every 10 years in obedience to a pledge made hundreds of years ago when a plague was killing the villagers and they were delivered from it in answer to their prayers. Darmstadt, Germany, I lived with an East German family. They had recently fled from the communists in the dark of night and left their home and all their possessions behind. They had little more than the necessities of life and other refugees in this camp had less. Some of these children never saw their prisoner fathers and others not until they were 10 years old. You've heard the story of the Pied Piper of Hamelin? Well, right here, where he is supposed to have performed his wonderful miracle, the German people have built their first consolidated school. It is modeled after American schools, and over $200,000 of the American money went into this school. It's known as the Schuldorf. And here is Heidelberg Castle in the famous town of Heidelberg in Germany, overlooking the Neckar River. This is the German Autobahn, similar to the Pennsylvania Turnpike here in America. It is perhaps not quite so smooth or wide, but is more scenic and is landscaped more artistically. These plump little fellows are German war orphans from an orphanage in Heidelberg. I wanted to bring one home with me, but of course I wasn't permitted to do so. Here's a restored village in Oslo, Norway. Scandinavian towns looked like this hundreds of years ago, but now they look much like American towns and cities. much military ritual. Here you see the changing of the guard at the King's Palace in Stockholm, Sweden. the greatest floral shop in the world, Kukanoff. 50 acres of tulips, hyacinths, and daffodils. The great outdoor show window for the bulb growers of Holland, whose business in America is so great that they have 10,000 Dutch salesmen in the United States selling us bulbs. And here's the great annual flower parade at Hillegem, Holland, where all the floats are made of complete flowers clipped each year from the flowering bulbs.
Francie was privileged to see the Queen of Denmark visit Queen Juliana of Holland at the Dutch Palace in Amsterdam. on the balcony at Queen Juliana's palace. In the land of the windmills, Francie visited with a little Dutch girl on the Markland Island in the Zuider Zee and watched her polish her first pair of leather shoes, her most prized possession. They cost her daddy, who makes only $18 per week, $7. The wooden shoes she wears on weekdays cost only $1. Lonesome for her cocker spaniel, Tootsie, Francie borrowed a street beggar's dog in Amsterdam and took it for a walk. Or perhaps we'd better say the dog took Francie for a walk. In Paris, I visited College Savigny. The girls there told me that no French teenage girl would think of wearing lipstick or fingernail polish. I enjoyed seeing the Eiffel Tower at a distance, but was a bit frightened when I rode up into its dizzy heights on an elevator. How's this for hitchhiking? People in European countries don't have much television or many other luxuries common to America, but they have wonderful zoos, and everybody goes to the zoo on a bright Sunday. This is Vincent Zoo in Paris. Bread is good, and to browse around the great Mofetard market was fun. laughingly said, you mustn't talk to me too long, you'll make my wife jealous. French young men and women can attend their world-famous Sorbonne University for little or nothing. Many have nothing and sleep on park benches. This French hot rodder and his girlfriend pick up an occasional Frank parading advertising signs. And this fella does sketches sketch he made of me. At the Tower of London, this English guard never blinked an eye when Francie marched alongside and tried to keep step with him. unusual celebrity Francie met was this fierce bird, Charles the Raven, one of six such birds kept at the Tower of London to prevent a curse from coming upon the British Empire. He's part of one of the many delightful traditions that surround this historic spot. Three long months of shuttling back and forth across Europe, 
and Francie was at last among English-speaking schoolmates at Bishop's Halt School near London. From class to class she went, engaging in a delightful exchange of conversation with the English boys and girls. She saw Queen Elizabeth and her royal family return triumphantly from their empire tour. But most important of all, she was back among schoolmates who knew how to play, and they taught Francie a brand new game, cricket. Just three months later, Francie found herself back where she started, tired but happy, and much, much wiser.